Hello, 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 greetings, salutations, konnichiwa, and every other form of greed across this vast, marvelous multiverse. I am Matsu Quinox, this is Horus, and welcome back, my dear, marvelous, wonderful scholars, to the study. <laughs> hello there, hello there, hello there. Hello there, Yulian20. Welcome, congratulations, and thank you for the subs resubscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello there, Firefly. Hello there, Private Maverick. Hello there, Dr. Zadium. Firefly, we are almost home from the grocery store. Didn't realize it was so late. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Just glad to have you here. Hello, 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 everyone. So, how is everyone this fine, glorious morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are across this fantastic multiverse? Dr. Zadium, doing well. Yulian 20, fantabulous. Is that a word? Is that a word, horse? I feel like we were asking that before once, if it was a word or not, and we decided it is a word, or at least it counts towards one. Ah, it is a word. Okay. If Yulian20 says it's a word, then I'm all for it. Oh, my goodness. As for myself and Horace, interesting time working in the study. Um, We ended up working in the fields of Gold Room. And the place is covered in pollen, and now I haven't colored, covered in pollen, and my allergies are flaring up horribly. Oh, my goodness. You wouldn't think that an omniversal bean would be able to have allergies, but apparently I do. So, uh, if you hear me sniffling, coughing, sneezing at all during the uh, stream, that is why. Ugh. Oh, congratulations, streak. What? You have a three-stream streak? Congratulations, Dr. Stadium. Dr. Zadium, they're special omniversal allergies. Yes, yes, they are. Oh, and uh, Yulian also got a three stream streak. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the viewership. Oh, it makes me so happy. And you know, I do this all for you, my dear scholars. Each stream is all for you. It makes me so happy to have you around, it makes me smile. Oh, my goodness. Million twenty, and we love it. Well, I hope you love it. If you didn't love it, then I wouldn't be. Then I would uh, try to make. It. Then I would try and. How do I put this mildly? I would try and help you enjoy it. Okay, that's a better word. So, my dear scholars, after last time's movie stream, tonight we are heading back to reading, mm -hmm. and. Thanks to all your wonderful votes, my dear scholars, you have chosen the book we're going to read tonight. And it's a book that's been um, in my mind for a while. Originally, I was going to read it during the holidays. Unfortunately, I got bitten by a book crocken, so I had to shelve that idea. Oh well. But we're finally going to read it. Tonight, we will be reading Sir Gawain. And the Green Knight. Ooh. Um, this will be a very different reading for us, admittedly. Um, so, a little background on the story. Uh, it's a poem, actually. Not really a story story. It, well, it, it's kind of a story. It's, um, it's a poetic tale, let's put it that way. Um, it was written in the late 14th century. Uh, we have no idea who wrote it. It was anonymous. It's usually referred to, I believe, as the Knight Writer. Um, or the Gawain Writer. One of the two. Um, and it is probably one of the better known pieces of Arthurian story lore. Alongside, of course, the once... What was it? The Once and Forever... What's the name of that book? Horace, do you remember what the name of that book is? Oh, I am blanking out tonight. Once and something king. What was it? The Once and Future King. That was the name of it. 
alongside that, and of course, Le Mort de Arthur, which is also one of the better known um, books. But Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is separate from that. Um, like I said, we don't know who wrote it. But it is one of the classics of 14th century literature from England. Um, alongside the work of Chaucer, of course. Can't forget Chaucer. Which I personally will never read on my stream because I cannot... Um, Top the wonderful Sophia Ignacy and her reading of the Canterbury Tales. I don't think anyone can. Um, but I digress. So tonight we'll be reading. Um, like I said, it'll be a very different read. I don't know if I'll be doing many voices. We'll see. I probably will try to. But the language, as you will see will be very different. And along the way, I will try and explain, to the best of my ability, some of the uh, more interesting contexts to the story. So, my dear scholars, shall we begin our journey back into the world of Camelot and read this wonderful Arthurian tale? Dr. Zadium says, I, Yulian 20, yes, please. All right. Well, my dear scholars, sit back, relax, have a hot or cold beverage of your liking, and let us read Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. <coughs> Is he? Fit one. The siege and the assault being ceased at Troy. Oh, I forgot. This is one. The siege and the assault being ceased at Troy, the battlements broken down and burnt to brands and ashes. The treacherous trickster whose treasons there flourished. That being Odysseus, apparently. And then 20, the knights who say. No, 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 no. Oh, Private Maverick. Nee! Nee! Where was I? The treacherous trickster whose treasons there flourished was famed for his falsehood, the foulest on earth. Aeneas the noble and his knightly kin then conquered kingdoms and kept in their hand. Well nigh all the wealth of the western lands, royal Romulus to Rome first turned, set up the city in splendid pomp, then named her with his own name, which now she still has. Tysicus founded Tuscany, townships raising. Lawnbeard and Lom Lombardy lifted up homes. And far over the French flood, Felix Brutus, on many spacious slopes, set Britain with joy and grace. Where war and feud and wonder have ruled the realm of space, and after bliss and blunder, by turns have run their race. So, um, it was a legend at one point in uh, England that England and Britain were basically discovered by former members of Troy. It was very much an in thing at the time to claim that your society was founded by a lost uh, member of Troy or a lost member of Rome, thereby making you seem more noble. Two. And when this Britain was built by this brave noble, here bold men bred in battle excluding, stirs of trouble in turbulent times, here many a marvel, marvel more than other lands, has befallen by fortune since that far time. But of all who abode here of Britain's kings, Arthur was highest in honor, as I have heard. So I intend to tell you of a true wonder which many folk mention as a manifest marvel, a happening eminent among Arthur's adventures. Listen to, me lay, listen to my lay but a little while. Straightway shall I speak it, in city as I heard it, with ton. As scribes have said it duly, in the lore of the land so long, with letters linking truly, in story bold and strong. 
3. This king lay at Camelot one Christmas tide, with many mighty lords, mainly liegemen, members rightly reckoned of the round table. In splendid celebrations, seemly and carefree, there tussling in tournament time and again, jousted in jollity, these gentle knights, then in court carnivals sang catches and danced. For fifteen days the feasting there was full in like measure, with all the meat and merry-making men could devise, gladly ringing glee, glorious to hear, a noble din by day, dancing at night. All was happiness in the height in halls and chambers, for lords and their ladies delectable joy, with all delights on earth, they house the air together, saving Christ's self, the most celebrated knights, the loveliest ladies to live in all time, and the comeliest king ever to keep court. For this fine fellowship was in its fair prime, far famed, stood well in heaven's will, in high-souled king acclaimed, so hardly a host on hill could not with ease be named. You'll notice that it um, alternates between verse and poetry. So most of these little sections start off with um, with verse, and then they will always end with a poem. Four. The year being so young that yester even saw its birth, that day double on the dyes were the diners served. Mass sun and service ended, straight from the chapel, the king and his company came into hall. Call on with cries from clergy and laity, Noel was newly announced, named time and again. Then lords and ladies leaped forth, Lagasse distributing, offered New Year's gifts in high voices, handed them out, bustling and bantering about these offerings. Ladies laughed full loudly, though losing their wealth. And he that won was not woeful, you may well believe. All this merriment they made until mealtime. Then in progress to their places they passed after washing. In authorized order, the high-ranking first, with glorious Guinevere, gay in the mist. On the princely platform with its precious hangings, of splendid silk at the sides, a state over her, of rich tapestry of Toulour and Turkestan, brilliantly embroidered with the best gems, of warranted worth that wealth at any time could buy. Fairest of form was this queen, glinting and gray of eye. No man could say he had ever he had seen a lovelier, but with a lie. <coughs> Five. But Arthur would not eat until all were served. He was charming and cheerful, childlike and gay, and loving active life, little did he favor. Lying down for lawn or lolling on a seat, so robust his young blood and his beating brain. Still he was stirred now by something else, his noble announcement that he never would eat, on such a fair feast day till informed in full of some unusual adventure as yet untold, of some momentous marvel that he might believe, about ancestors or arms or other high theme. Or till a stranger should seek out a strong knight of his, to join with him in jousting, in jeopardy to lay, life against life, each allowing the other, the favor of fortune, the fair lot. Such was the king's custom when he kept court, at every fine feast among his free retinue in hall. So he trove amid the throng, a ruler royal and tall, still standing staunch and strong, and young like the year withal. Six. Uh, do you want me to uh, include the numbers of each verse, or should I leave out those numbers? What say you, my dear scholars?
Union 20 says include it. All right. Six. Erect stood the strong king, stately of mine, trifling time with talk before the topmost table. Good Gawain was placed at Guinevere's side, and Agravain of the ha hard hand sat on the other side. Both the king's sister's sons, staunchest of knights. Above Bishop Baldwin began the board. And Wayne, Urin's son, ate next to him. These were disposed on the dies and with dignity served, and many mighty men next marshaled at side tables. Then the first course came in, excuse me, with such crack, cracking of trumpets, whence bright bedecked blazons in banners hung, such din of drumming and a deal of fine piping, such wild warbles, whelming and echoing, that hearts were uplifted high at the strains, that delicacies and dainties were delivered to the guests, fresh food and fosum, such freight of full dishes, that space was scarce at the social tables, for the several soups sat set before them in silver on the cloth. Each feaster made free with the fare, took lightly a nothing loath, twelve plates were for every pair, good beer and bright wine both. Seven. Of their meal I shall mention no more just now, for it is evident to all that ample was served. Now another noise, quite new, neared suddenly, likely to allow the liege lord to eat, for barely had the blast of trumpet abated one minute, and the first course in the court been courteously served when there heaved in at the hall door an awesome fellow, who in height outstripped all earthly men. From throat to thigh he was so thick-set and square, his loins and limbs were so long and so great, that he was half a giant on earth, I believe. Yet mainly and most of all a man he seemed. And the handsomest of horsemen, though huge at that, for though at back and at breast his body was broad, his hips and haunches were elegant and small, and perfectly proportioned were all parts of the man as seen. Men gaped at the hue of him, ingrained in garb and mind, a fellow fiercely grim, and all a glittering green. 8. And garments of green girt the fellow about, a two-third length tunic tight at the waist, a comely cloak on top accomplished, ac yeah, accomplished with lining of the finest fur to be found, made of one piece. Marvelous fur-trimmed material with matching hood, lying back from his locks and laid on his shoulders. Fitly held up hose in hue the same green that was caught at the calf with clinking, clicking spurs beneath of bright gold on bases of, el of embroidered silk. But no iron shoe armored that horseman's feet, and verily his vesture were, was all vivid green. So were the bars on his belt and the brilliant set in ravishing array on this rich Acroitments about himself and his saddle on the silken work. It would be tedious to tell a tith of the trifles embossed and embroidered, such as birds and flies, in gay green gauds with gold everywhere, the breast hangings of the horse in haughty crupper, the enameled knobs and nails on its bridle, the stirrups that he stood on were all stained with the same. So were the splendid saddle skirts and bows that ever glimmered and glinted with their green stones. The steed that he spurred on was similar in hue to the sight. Green and huge of grain, meddlesome in might, and brusque with bit and rein, a steed to serve that night. 
Oh my goodness. He does sound like a fearsome fellow, doesn't he? Nine. Yes, garbed all in green was the gallant rider. And the hair of his head was the same hue as his horse. Oh, hello there, Kintron. Welcome. Alteration abounds. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. A lot of that in here. And floated finely like a fan round his shoulder. And the great bushy beard on his breast flowing down, with the heavy hair hanging from his head, was shown below the shoulder, sheared right round, so that half his arms were under the encircling hair, covered as by a king's cape that closes at the neck. The mane of that mighty horse, much like the beard, well crisped and combed, was copiously plaited with twists of twining gold, twinkling in the green, first a green gossamer, a golden one next. His flowing tail and forelock followed suit, and both were bound with bands of bright green, ornamented to the end with exquisite stones, while a thorn running through them threaded on high. Many bright golden bells, burnished and ringing. Such a horse, such a horseman in the whole wide world, was never seen observed by those assembled before. Not one. Lightning-like he seemed, and swift to strike and stun, his dreadful blows men deemed, once dealt, meant death was done. 10. Yet hauberk and helmet had he none, nor, plasta nor plastron, nor plate armor proper to combat, nor shield for shoving, nor sharp spear for lunging, <coughs> but he held a holly cluster in one hand, holly that is greenest when groves are gaunt and bare, and an axe in his other hand, huge and monstrous, a hideous helmet smasher for anyone to tell of. The head of that axe was an L rod lawn, of green hammered gold and steel was the socket, and the blade was burnished bright with a broad edge, acutely honed for cutting, as keenest razors are. The grim man gripped it by its strong, great strong handle, which was wound with iron all the way to the end, and graven in green with graceful designs. A cord curved round it was caught at the head, then hitched to the haft at intervals and loops, with costly tassels attached thereto in plenty. On bosses of bright green embroidered richly, in he rode and up the hall, this man, driving towards the high dyes, dreading no danger. He gave no one a greeting, but glared over all. And now i got to do a voice, so I'm going to have to hydrate for this. Let me practice for a second, my dear scholars. Give me one moment. His opening utterance was, Who and where is the governor of this gathering? Gladly would I behold him with my eyes, and have speech with him, he frowned. Took note of every night as he ramped and rode around, then stopped to study who might be the noble most renowned. 11. The assembled folks stared, long scanning the fellow, for all men marveled what it might mean that a horseman and his horse should have such a color as to, go gr as to grow green as grass, and greener yet, it seemed. More godly glowing than green enamel on gold, 
Those standing studied him and sidled towards him, with all the world's wonder as to what he would do. For astonishing sights they had seen, but such a one never. Therefore, a phantom from fairyland, the folk there deemed him. So even the doughy was were daunted and dared not reply. All sitting stock still, astounded by his voice. Throughout the hall, throughout the hall, <laughs> throughout the high hall was a hush like death. Suddenly, as if all had slipped into sleep, their voices were at rest. Hush not wholly for fear, but some at honor's behest, and let him whom all revere greet that gruesome guest. 12. <coughs> for Arthur sensed an exploit before the high dies, and accorded him courteous greeting, no craven he saying to him, Sir Knight, you are certainly welcome. I am the I am head of this house. Arthur is my name. Please dine to dismount and dwell with us till you impart your purpose at a proper time. May he that sits in heaven help me, said the knight. But my intention was not to tarry in this turreted hall. But as your reputation, royal sir, is raised up so high, and your castle and cavaliers are accounted the best, the mightiest of mail-clad men in mounted fighting, the most warlike, the worthiest the world has bred, most valiant to vie with in viral contests, and as chivalry is shown here, so I am assured. At this time, I tell you, that has attracted me here. By this branch that I bear, you may be certain that I proceed in peace, no peril seeking. For had I fared forth in fighting gear, my hauberk, my hybrick and helmet, both at home now, my shield and sharp spear all shining bright, and other weapons to wield I would have brought. However, as I wish for no war here, I wear soft clothes. But if you are as bold as brave men affirm, you will gladly grant me the good sport I demand by right. Then Arthur answer gave, If you, most noble knight, unarmored combat crave, will fail you not in fight. 13. No, it is not combat I crave, for come to that, on this bench only beardless boys are seating. Oh boy, that is quite an insult. If I were hasped in armor on a high steed, no man among you would could match me, your might being meager. So I crave in this court a Christmas game, for it is Yuletide and New Year, and young men are bound here. If any in this household is so hearty in spirit, of such meddlesome mind and so madly rash, as to strike a strong blow in return for another, I shall offer to him this fine axe freely. This axe, which is heavy enough to handle as he please, and I shall bide the first blow, as bare as I sit here. If some intrepid man is tempted to try what I su suggest, let him leap towards me, and lay hold of this weapon. Acquiring clear possession of it, no claim from me is suring. Then shall I stand up to his stroke, quite still on this floor, so long as I shall have leave to launch a return blow unchecked. 
Yet he still have a year, and a day's reprieve I direct. Now hasten and let me hear. Who answers? To what effect? It's very hard to do with the Green Knight's voice. Oh my goodness. Fourteen. If he had astonished them at the start, yet stiller now were the henchmen in hall, both high and low. The rider wrenched himself round in his saddle and rolled his red eyes about roughly and strangely, bending his brow, bristling and bright on all. His beard swaying as he strained to see who would rise. When none came to accord with him, he coughed aloud, then pulled himself up proudly and spoke as follows. What? Is this Arthur's house, the honor of which is bruited abroad, abroad so abruptly? Has your pride disappeared, your prowess gone? Your victories, your valor, your vaunts, where are they? The revel and renown of the round table is now overwhelmed by a word from one man's voice. For all flinch for fear from a fight not begun. Upon this... No, that's not it. Oh, hello there, Legacy Bookish. Welcome. We are reading Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Upon this, he laughed so loudly that the Lord grieved, his fair features filled with blood for shame. He raged as roar yeah. he raged as roaring gale, as yeah. he raged as roaring gale. His followers felt the same. The king, not one to quail, to that cavalier then came. Legacy bookish, nice, sounds great. Oh, it is. It's it's. I've always wanted to read this story. It's one of my favorites. That might sound a little bit odd, but I have heard bits and pieces, so I'm rather fond of the concept of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Fifteen. By heaven, then said Arthur, what you ask is foolish, but as firmly you seek, but as you firmly seek folly, find it you shall. No good man here is aghast at your great words. Hand me your axe now, for heaven's sake, and I shall bestow the boon you bid us give. He sprang towards him swiftly, seized it from his hand, and fiercely the other fellow footed the floor. Now Arthur had his axe, and holding it by the haft, swung it about sternly, as if to strike with it. Kintron. They should know better than bartering with the Feywild. Yes, yes, there is always a catch if you're dealing with Fey. I should know that. The strong man stood before him, stretched to his full height, higher than any in the hall by a head and more. Stern of face he stood there, stroking his beard turning down his tunic in a tranquil manner, less unmanned and dismayed by the mighty strokes than if a banqueter at the bench had brought him a drink of wine. Then Gawain, at Guinevere's side, bowed and spoke, and spoke his design. Before all, king, confide this fight to me. May it be mine. Sixteen. If you would, worthy lord, said Gawain to the king, bid me stir from this seat and stand beside you, allowing me without less majesty to leave the table, and if my liege lady were not displeased thereby, I should come there to console you before this court of nobles, for it appears unmeet to me, as manners go. When your hall he has uttered such a haughty request, though you gladly agree for you to grant it yourself, when on the benches about you many such bold men sit, 
under heaven I hold the highest mettled. There be no braver knights when battle is joined. I am the weakest, the most wanting in wisdom, I know, and my life, if lost, would be less least missed. Truly, only through your being my uncle am I to be valued. Oh, that's that's kind of hard on going. Going, don't be so hard on yourself. No bounty but your blood in my body do I know, and since this affair is too foolish to fall to you, and I first asked it of you, make it over to me. And if I fail to speak fiendly, let this full court judge without blame. Yulian Twenty, poor guy. Yeah, yeah, he's so hard on himself. Then wisely they whispered of it, and after all said the same, that the crowned king should be quit, and Gawain given the game. Seventeen. Then the king commanded the courtly knight to rise. He directly uprose, approached courteously, knelt low to his liege lord, laid hold of the weapon, and he graciously let him have it, lifted up his hand and gave him God's blessing, gladly urging him to be strong in spirit and stout of sinew. Cousin, take care, said the king, to chop once. And if you strike with success, certainly I think you will take the return blow without trouble in time. Yulian 20, brave or foolhardy? That is the question. Is Gawain a brave man, or is he an absolute fool in taking this challenge? Gripping the great axe, Gawain goes to the man, who awaits him unwaveringly, unwavering, not quailing at all. Then said to Sir Gawain, the stout knight in green, Let us affirm our pact freshly, before going farther. I beg you, bold sir, to be so good as to tell me your true name, as I trust you to. In good faith, said the good knight, Gawain is my name, and whatever happens after I offer you this blow, and in twelve months, yeah. and in twelve months' time sh I shall take the return blow, with whatever weapon you wish, and with no one else shall I strive. The other with pledge replied, I'm the merriest man alive. It's a blow from you I must bide. Sir Gawain, so may I thrive. 18. By God, said the Green Knight, Sir Gawain, I rejoice that I shall have from your hand what I have asked for here, and you have gladly gone over in good discourse the covenant I requested of the king in full except that you seem assent, swearing in truth, to seek me yourself in such place as you think, to find me under the fearment and fetch your payment for what you deal me today before this dignified gathering. How shall I hunt for you? How find your home? said Gawain. By God that made me, I go in ignorance. Nor, knight, do I know your name or, or your court. But instruct me truly therefore, and tell me your name, and I shall wear out my wits to find my way there. Here is my oath on it, in absolute honour. That is enough this new year. No more is needed, said the gallant in green to Gawain the courteous. To tell you the truth, when I have taken the blow after you have duly dealt it, I shall directly inform you about my house, and my home, and my own name. Then you may keep your covenant, and call on me, and I waif you no words, then well may you prosper. Stay long in your own land, and look for no further trial. 
Now grip your weapon grim. Let us see your fighting style. Gladly, said Gawain to him, stroking the steel the while. Nineteen. On the ground the green knight graciously stood, with head slightly slanting to expose, expose the flesh. His lawn and lovely locks he laid over his crown, bearing the naked neck for the business now due. Gawain gripped his axe and gathered it on high, advanced the left foot before him on the ground, and slashed swiftly down on the exposed part, so that the sharp blade sheared through, shattering the bones, sank deep in the slick flesh, split it in two, and the scintillating steel struck the ground. The fair head fell from the neck, struck the floor, and people spurned it as it rolled around. 20 sounds hard. Well, that is rather gruesome. That is rather gruesome for a story like this. Blood spurted from the body, bright against the green. Yet the fellow did not fall, nor falter one whit, but stoutly sprang forward on legs still sturdy, roughly reached out among the ranks of nobles, seized his splendid head and straightway lifted it. Then he strode to his steed and snatched the bridle, stepping into the stirrup and swung soft, swun, swun aloft. <coughs> Excuse me. Holding his head in his hand by the hair, he settled himself in the saddle as steadily, as if nothing had happened to him, though he had no head. Kintron, you can't even say he was poorly ex- Ugh! Come on, Kintron. Ugh. As if nothing had happened to him, though he had no head. He twisted his trunk about, that gruesome body that bled. He caused much dread and doubt by the time his say was said. Another drink. Twenty. For he held the head in his hand upright. Can Sean never go to Gawain as a barber and ask for a little off the top? <laughs> that is true. That is true. Oh, don't, don't. For he had the head. For he held the head in his hand upright. Pointed the face at the fairest in fame on the dais, and it lifted its eyelids and looked glaringly and menacingly said with its mouth, as you may now hear, Be prepared to perform what you promised, Gawain. Seek faithfully till you find me, my fine fellow. According to your oath in this hall in these night's hearing, go to the green chapel without gaining saying to get such a stroke as you have struck. Strictly you deserve that due redemption on the day of New Year. As the knight of the Green Chapel I am known to many. Therefore, if you ask for me, I shall be found. So come, or else be called coward accordingly. Then he savagely swerved, sawing at the reins, rushed out at the hall door his head in his hand, and the flint-struck fire flew, flew up from the hooves. What place he departed to, no person there knew, nor could any account be given of the country he had come from. What then? At the green knights, Gawain and King grinned and laughed again. What? Why are they laughing? 
when such a horrible thing happened? I mean, seriously. He's got to go and get his head chopped off. Why is he laughing? But plainly approve the thing as a marvel in the world of men. Twenty one. Though honored King Arthur was at heart astounded, he let no sign of it be seen, but said clearly to the comely queen in courtly speech, Do not be dismayed, dear lady, today. Such cleverness comes well at Christmas tide, like the plain of interludes, laughter and song, as lords and ladies delight in courtly carols. However, I am now able to eat the repast, having seen, I must say, a sight to wonder at. He glanced at Sir Gawain, and gracefully said, Now, sir, hang up your axe. You have hewn enough. And on the back, cl black, bleh, and on the back cloth above the dais, it was boldly hung where all men might mark it and marvel at it, and with truthful testimony tell the wonder of it. Then to the table the two went together. The king and the constant knight and king men served them double portions of each dainty with all due dignity. All manner of meat and ministry too. Day long they delighted till darkness came to their shores. Now Gawain gave a thought, lest peril make you pause, in seeking out the sport that you have claimed as yours. One second, scholars. Fit two. Twenty two. Such earnest of noble action had Arthur at New Year, for he was av avid, of, for he was avid to hear exploits vaunted. Though starved of such speeches when seated at first, now had they high manner indeed, their hands full of it. Gawain was glad to begin the games in hall, but though the end be heavy, have no wonder, for if men are sprightly in spirit after strong drink, soon the year slides past, never the same twice. There is no foretelling its fulfillment from the start. Yes, this yuletide passed, and the year following. Season after season in succession went by. After Christmas comes the crabbed Lenten time, when forces on the flesh, fish, and food yet plainer. Then winter more vernal wars with the wintry world. The cold ebbs and declines, the clouds lift. In shining showers the rain sheds warmth, and fall upon the fair plain, where flowers appear. The grassy lawns and groves alike are garbed in green. Birds prepare to build and brightly sing. The solace of the ensuing summer that soothes hill and dell. By hedgerow rank and rich, the blossoms bloom and swell, and sounds of sweetest pitch from lovely woodlands well. Then comes the season of summer with soft winds, when Zephyrus himself breathes on seeds and herbs. In paradise is the plant that springs in the open, when the dripping dew drops from its leaves, and it bears the blissful gleam of the bright sun. Then a harvest comes hurrying, urging it on, warning it because of winter to wax ripe soon. He drives the dust to rise with the drought he brings, 
forcing it to fly up from the face of the earth. Wrathful winds and raging skies wrestle with the sun. Leaves are lashed loose from the trees and lie, be lie on the ground, and the grass becomes gray, which was green before. What rose from root at first now ripens and rots. Oh my goodness, there is such, there is a lot of alterate alteration in this story. So the year in passing yields its many yesterdays, and winter returns as the way of the world is, I swear. So when the Michaelmas moon with winter threatening there, and Guywin considered soon the fell way he must fare. Dr. Zadium, a little, a little or at sun? What? A little or at sun? Oh, at eight sun. Alteration. Oh! Alliteration. Alliteration. Okay. Okay. Twenty four. Yet he stayed in hall with Arthur till All Saints' Day, when Arthur prov provided plain. Yeah. Would Arthur provided plentifully, especially for Gawain. A rich feast and high revelry at the Round Table. The gallant lords and gay ladies greeted for Gawain, anxious on his account. But all the same, they mentioned only matters of mirthful import joylessly joking for that gentle knight's sake. For after dinner with drooping heart he addressed his uncle, and spoke plainly of his departure, putting it thus. Now, liege lord of my life, I beg my leave of you. You know the kind of covenant it is. I care little to tell over the trials of it, trifling as they are. But I am bound to bear the blow, and must be gone to-morrow, to seek the gallant in green, as God sees fit to guide me. Then the most courtly in that company came together, Wayne and Eric and others in troops, Sir Dodenal the Fierce, the Duke of Clarence, Lancelot and Lionel and Lucan the Good, Sir Bors and Sir, Benev and Sir Bened Bedivere, both strong men, and many admired knights, with Madur of the gate. All the company of the court came near to, uh, to the king, while crackling care in their hearts to console the knight. Much shearing sorrow was suffered in the hall, that such a gallant man as Gawain should go in quest to suffer a savage blow, and his sword no more should bear. Said Gawain, gay of cheer, Whether fate be found or fair, Foul or fair, why falter I or fear? What should man man do but dare? Interesting way of thinking about the universe. Twenty five. He dwelt there all that day, and at dawn on the morrow asked for his armor. Every item was brought. First, a crimson carpet was cast over the floor and the great pile of gilded war gear glittered upon it. The strong man stepped on it, took the steel in hand. The doublet he dressed in was dear Turkestan stuff. Then came the courtly cape, cut with skill, finely lined with fur and fastened close. Then they let set the steel shoes on the strong man's feet lapped his legs in steel with lovely greaves, complete with knee-pieces polished bright, and connecting it at the knee with gold-knobbed hinges. Well, this is fancy. Then came the cusses, which cunningly enclosed his thigh stick of thew, and which thawn secured. Next the hauberk, interlinked with argent steel rings, which rested on rich material, wrapped the warrior round. He had polished armor on arms and elbows, glinting and gay, and gloves of metal, and all the goodly gear to give help whatever betide. 
with sure coat richly wrought, gold spurs attached in pride, a silken sword belt athwart, and steadfast blade at his side. 26. When he was hafted in armor, his harness was noble. The least lace or loop was lustrous with gold. So harnessed as he was, he heard his mass, as it was offered at the high altar in worship. Then he came to the king and his court fellows, took leave with loving courtesy of lord and lady, who commended him to Christ and kissed him farewell. By now Gringolet had been got ready, and girt with a saddle. Oh, that's the name of his horse, then. Gringolet, that is an interesting name that gleamed most gaily with many golden fringes, everywhere nailed newly for this noble occasion. The bridle was embossed and bound with bright gold, so were the furnishings of the foreharness and the fine skirts. The crupper and the and the yeah, and the caparison accorded with the saddle bows, and all were laid on red with nails of richest gold which glittered and glanced like gleams of the sun, that is, cask, that is cask, equipped with clasps of great strength, and padded and sized, he seized and swiftly kissed. It towered high on his head and was, ha and was hasped at the back, with a brilliant silk band over the burnished neck guard, embroidered and bossed with the best gems. On broad silken borders with birds about, about the seams, such as parrots painted with periwinkles between, and turtles in true love knots traced as thickly, as if many beauties in a bower had been busy seven winters thereabout. The circlet on his head was prized most precious, no doubt, and perfectly diamond, through a gleaming luster out. Twenty seven. Then they showed him the shield of shining ghouls, with the pentacle with the pentacle in pure gold depicted thereon. He brandished it by the baldric, and about his neck. He slung it in a seemly way, and it suited him well. And I intend to tell you, though I tarry therefore, why the pentacle is proper to this prince of knights. It is a symbol which Solomon conceived once to betoken holy truth by its intricate rite, for it is a figure which has five points, and each line overlaps and is locked with another. And it is endless everywhere, and the English call it, in all the land I hear, the endless knot. Therefore it goes with Sir Gawain and his gleaming armor, Forever faithful in five things, each in fivefold manner, Sir Gawain was reputed good and like gold well refined. He was devoid of all villainy, every virtue displaying in the field. Thus this pentacle knew he carried on coat and shield, as a man of troth most true and knightly name annealed. 28. First he found faultless in his five wits. Next his five fingers never failed the knight, and all his trust on earth was in the five wounds which came to Christ on the cross, as the creed tells. And whenever the bold man was busy on the battlefield, th through all other things he thought on this, that his prowess all depended on the five pure joys. Kintron, so Gawain is riding around with a pentagram on him. Yes, he is. It's a symbol. He is uh, the pentagram knight. That his prowess all depended on the five pure joys that the Holy Queen of Heaven had of her child. According, accordingly, the courteous knight had that queen's image etched on the inside of his armored shield, so that when he beheld her, his heart did not fail. 
the fifth five I find the famous man practiced were liberality, liberality and loving kindness leading the rest. It's funny that loving kindness is actually one word in this text rather than two. Then his continence and courtesy, which were never corrupted. And piety, the surpassing virtue. These pure five were more firmly fixed on that fine man than on any other, and every multiplied. Every interlocking with another had no end, being fixed to five points which never failed, never assembling on one side, nor sundering either, with no end at any angle, nor can I find where the design started or proceeded to its end. Thus on his shining shield that knot was shaped, royally in red gold upon red guiles. That is the pure pentacle, so people who are wise are taught. Now Gawain was ready and gay, his spear he promptly caught, and gave them all good day, forever, as he thought. Twenty nine. He struck the steed with his spurs and sprang on his way, so forcefully that the fire flew up from the f flinty stones. All who saw that seemingly sight was were sick at heart, and all said to each other softly in the same breath, in care for that comely knight, "By Christ, it is evil that yon lord should be lost, who lives so nobly." Trying to see if their language. Give me one second, my just calls. Oh, I see. To find his fellow on earth in faith is not easy. It would have been wiser to have worked more wearily, and to have dubbed this the dear man a duke of the realm, a magnificent master of men he might have been, and so had a happier fate than to be utterly destroyed, beheaded by an unearthly being out of arrogance, who supposed the prince would approve such counsel as is giddily given in Christmas games by knights. <laughs> Many were the watery tears that whelmed from weeping eyes when on quest that worthy knight went from the court that day. He faltered nor not nor feared, but quickly went his way. His road was rough and weird, or so the stories say. Thirty. Now the gallant Sir Gawain in God's name goes, riding through the realm of Britain, no rapture in his mind. Off in the long night he lay alone and companionless, and did not find in front of him food of his choice. He had no comrade but his courser in the country wood, to wood and hills, no traveler to talk to on the track but God, till he was nearly nigh to northern Wales. The island of Agle Aglesi he kept always on his left, and fared across the fords by the foreshore, over at Holy Head to the other side, into the wilderness of Wirral, where few dwelled, to whom God or good-hearted men give their gave their hit. One second. To whom God or good-hearted men gave his love, and always he went. He asked whomever he met if they knew or had knowledge of a knight in green, or could guide him to the ground where a green chapel stood. And there was none but said him nay, for never in their lives had they set eyes on someone of such a hue as green. His way was wild and strange, by dreary here in hill and dean. His mood would many times change before that fane was seen. Thirty one. He rode far from his friends, a forsaken man, scaling many cliffs in country unknown. At every bank or beach where the brave man crossed water, he found a foe in front of him, 
except by a freak of chance. And so foul of fierce a one that he was forced to fight. So many marvels did the man meet in the mar in the mountain <laughs> in the mountains in the mountains. It would be too tedious to tell a tenth of them. He had death struggles with dragons, did battle with wolves, warred with wild men who dwelt among the crags, battled with bulls and bears and boars at other times, and ogres that panted after him on the high fells. Now that would be interesting. I wonder if anyone's ever written like a story that fills in all the adventures Gawain has during this journey. Because it sounds like he had a lot of them. It would be interesting if someone expanded on that concept. Had he not been doity in, endur in endurance and dutiful to God, doubtless he would have been done to death time and again. Yet the warring little worried him. Worse was the winter, when the cold, clear water cascaded from the clouds and froze before it could fall to the fallow, fallow earth. Half slain by the sleet, he slept in his armor, night after night among the naked rocks, where the cold streams splashed from the steep crests or hung high over his head in high ice, hard icicles. So in peril and pain, in perilous plight, this night covered the country till Christmas Eve alone, and he that even tied to Mary made his moan and begged her be his guide till some shelter should be shown. Union 20 sounds miserable. It does really sound miserable, like a miserable time. 32. Merrily in the morning by a mountain he rode into a wondrously wild wooden cleft, with huge hills on each side overpeering a forest of huge hoary oaks, a hundred, a hundred together. The hazel and the hawthorn were intertwined, with rough ragged moss trailing everywhere, and on the bleak branches birds in misery, piet piteously piped away, pinched with cold. The gallant knight on Gringolet galloped under them, though many a swamp and marsh, a man all alone, fearing lest he should fail through adverse fortune, to see the service of him who that same night was born of a bright maiden to banish our strife. And so sighing, he said, I beseech thee, Lord, and the eh. Oh, thank you for the hydrate, Celine. Welcome. We are reading Gawain and the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Goodness. It's been an interesting read so far. Very different language, very different writing. And so sign he said. I beseech thee, Lord, and thee, Mary, mildest mother so dear, that in some haven with due honour I might I may hear mass and may matins to morrow morning. Meekly I ask it, and promptly thereto I pray my pater and Ave and Creed. Oh thank you for the uh posture check. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Celine, it is a good story. It is a good story so far. I'm really enjoying it. He crossed himself and cried for his sins and said, Christ, speed my cause, his cross my God. So prayed he, spurring his steed. 33. Thrice the sign of the Savior on himself he had made. When in the wood he was aware of a dwelling with a moat on a promontory above a plateau, penned in by the boughs and tremendous trunks of trees, and trenched about. The comeliest castle that ever a knight owed, owned. It was pitched on a plain with a park all round, impregnably palisade with pointed stakes, and containing, containing many trees in its two mile circumference. The courteous knight Com yeah. 
The courteous knight contemplated the castle from one side, as it shimmered and shone through the shining oaks. Then humbly he took off his helmet and offered thanks to Jesus and St. Julian, gentle patrons both, who had given him grace and gratified his wish. Now grant it be good lodging, the gallant knight said. Then he goaded Gringolets with his golden heels, and mostly by chance emerged on the main highway, which brought the brave man to the bridge's end with one cast. The drawbridge vertical, the gate shut firm and fast, the well-provided wall, it bleached at never a blast. It bleached at never a blast. Thirty-four. The knight, still on his steed, stayed on the bank of the deep double ditch that drove round the place. The wall went into the water wonderfully deep, and then to a huge height upwards it reared, its hard-hewn stone up to the con cornice, built under the battlements in the best style. Courses jutted and turrets protruded between constructed with loopholes in plenty with locking shutters. No better barbican had ever been beheld by that night. And inside he could see a splendid high hall, with towers and turrets on top, all tipped with crenellations and pretty pinnacles placed along its length. With carved copes cunningly worked, many chalk-white chimneys, the cat the chevalier saw, on the tops of towers twinkling whitely, so many painted pinnacles sprinkled everywhere, congregated in clusters among the crenellations, that it appeared like a prospect of paper pattering. Patterning. To the gallant knight on Gringolot it seemed good enough, if he could ever gain entrance to the inner court, and harbor in that house while holy day lasted well cheered. He hailed, at an, uh, he hailed, and at a height, a civil porter appeared, who welcomed the wandering knight, and his inquiry heard. 35. Good sir, said Gawain, will you give my message to the high lord of this house, that I ask for lodging? Yes, by St. Peter replied the porter, and I think you may lay lodge here as long as you like, sir knight. Then away he, then away he went eagerly and swiftly returned, with a host of well-wishers to welcome the knight. This seems a little too convenient, don't you think, that he just finds this castle in the middle of nowhere while he's begging for a, uh, a place to stay? Celine, ooh, creaky porter. Yes, <laughs> yes, the creaky porter. I, that's the best voice I could come up with. You need twenty. How convenient it is! Very convenient. Where was I? They let down the drawbridge and, in a dignif dignified way, came out and did honor to him, kneeling courteously on the cold ground to accord him worthy welcome. Celine, I mean, yeah, super convenient. That's exactly how being a knight is. I suppose so. I suppose so. I wouldn't know. I'm not a knight. I do know a certain knight, but he's rather corrupted, so I don't know if he would have an answer to this question. Where is it? They prayed him to pass the portcullis, now pulled up high, and he readily bid them rise and rode over the bridge. Servants held his saddle while he stepped down, and his steed was stabled by sturdy men in plenty. Strong knights and squires descended them to bring the bold warrior blithely into hall. When he took off his helmet, many hurried forward to receive it and to serve this stately man, and his bright sword and buckler were both taken as well. Then graciously he greeted each gallant knight, and many proud men pressed forward to pay their respects. Garbed in his fine garments, he was guided to the hall, where a fine fire was burning fiercely on the hearth. 
Then the prince of those people appeared from his chamber to meet in mannerly style the man in his hall. You are welcome to dwell here as you wish, he said. Treat everything as your own, and have what you please in this place. I yield my best thanks yet. May Christ make good your grace. Oh, that's going. I yield my best thanks, yes. May Christ make good your grace, said Gawain, and gladly met. They clasped in close embrace. Celine, ah, totally a thing to ask crew later. Celine, press forward to pay respects has a different meaning today, but it's a nice picture all the same. <laughs> true, true. Yes, I will have to ask Crusader if that's a common thing that happens to knights. 36. Gawain gazed at the gallant who had greeted him well, and it seemed to him the stronghold possessed a brave lord, a powerful man in his prime of stupendous size. Broad and bright was his beard, all beaver, beaver hued. Strong and sturdy he stood on his stalwart legs. His face was fierce as fire, free was his speech, and he seemed in good sooth a suitable man to be prince of a people with companions of metal. This prince led him to an apartment and express, expressly commanded that a man be commissioned to minister to Gawain, and at his bidding a band of men bent to serve, brought him to a beautiful room where the bedding was noble, the bed curtains of brilliant silk with bright gold bright gold hems had skillfully sewn coverlets with comely facings, and the fairest fur on the fringes was worked with ruddy gold rings on the cords around the curtains, Tourlouse and Turkestan tapestries on the wall, and fine car carpets underfoot on the floor were fittingly matched. There amid merry talks the man was disrobed and stripped of his battle battle sark and his splendid clothes. Retainers readily brought him rich robes of the choicest kind to choose from and change into, in a trice when he looked in a trice when he took one and was attired in it, and it sat on and it sat on him in style with spreading with spreading skirts, excuse me. And it certainly seemed to those assembled as if spring in all its hues were evident before them. Celine, I like your young, passionate night voice. Very faint. Oh, thank you. His lithe limbs below the garments were gleaming with beauty. Jesus never made so men judged more gentle and handsome a knight. From what, from wherever in the world he were, at sight it seemed he might be a prince without a peer in field where full, where fell men fight. Thirty-seven. At the chimneyed hearth where car charcoal burned, a chair was placed for Sir Gawain, in gracious style, gorgeously decked with cushions on quilted work, both cunningly wrought. And then on that man a magnificent mantle was thrown, a gleaming garment gorgeously embroidered, fairly lined with fur, the finest skins of ermine on earth, and his hood of the same. In that splendid seat he sat in dignity, and warmth came to him at once, bringing well-being. In a trice on fine trestles a table was put up, then covered with a cloth shining clean and white, and set with silver spoons, salt cellars, and overlays. The worthy knight washed willingly, and went to his meat in seemingly enough style servants eh, in seemingly enough style servants brought him. Several fine soups seven, seen as, eh, I can't talk apparently tonight. I apologize, my dear scholars. Oh my goodness. Several fine soups seasoned lavishly, twice fold as is fitting, and fish of all kinds, some baked in bread, some browned on coals, some seethed some stewed and savored with spice, but always subtly sauced. And so the man liked it. The gentle knight generously judged it, judged it a feast, and often said so, while the servers spurred him on thus as he ate. This, pe this present penance due, it soon shall be offset. 
the night rejoiced anew, for the wine his spirits wet. 38. Then in seemly style they searchedly inquired, putting to the prince private questions, so that he courteously conceded he came of that court, where high-souled Arthur held sway alone, ruler most royal of the round table. And that Sir Gawain himself now sat in the house, having come that Christmas by course of fortune. Loudly laughed the lord when he learned what night he had in his house. Such happiness it brought, that all the men within the moat made merry, and promptly appeared in the presence of Gawain, to whose per person are proper all prowess and worth, and pure and perfect manners, and praises unceasing. His reputations rates first in the ranks of men. Each knight nearest, neared his neighbor and softly said, Now we shall see displayed the seemly, seemly Now we shall see displayed the seemliness manners and the faultless figures of virtuous discourse. Without asking we may hear how to hold conversation, such we have seized upon the scion of good breeding. God has given us of his grace good measure in granting us such a guest as Gawain is. When contented at Christ's birth, the courtiers shall sit and sing. This noble knight will prove what manners the mighty bring. His converse of courtly love shall spur our studying. Oh my goodness. I'm trying to find a good stopping point, my dear scholars. Um... I think I'll read a few more, and then we'll stop for now. Celine, are you uh, are you nearing your end? I I I can feel myself nearing the end of my energy, to be honest. Kinchon, at least it's got numbers. At least it's got numbers. Yes, unlike a certain other book. I will try and read two more pages. Thirty nine. When the fine man had finished his food and risen, it was nigh and near to the night's mid-hour. I wonder what that is. Priests to their prayers paced their way and rang the bells royally, as rightly they should, to honor that high feast with even song. The Lord inclines to prayer, the lady too. Into her private pew she prettily walks. Gawain advances gaily and goes there quickly. But the Lord gripped his gown and guided him to his seat, acknowledged him by name, and benevolently said in the whole world he was the most welcome of men. Gawain spoke his gratitude, then they gravely embraced, and sat in serious mood the whole service through. Then the lady had a longing to look on the night. With her bevy of beauties she abandoned her pew, most beautiful of body and bright of complexion most winsome in ways of all women alive. She seemed to Sir Gawain, excelling Guinevere, to squire that splendid dame. He strode through the, cha the chancel. Another lady led her by the left hand, a matron much older, past middle age, who was highly honored by the escort of squires. Most unlike to look on those ladies were, for if the one was winsome, then withered was the other. Hues rich and rubious were arrayed on the one, rough wrinkles on the other rutted the cheeks. Kerchified with clear pearls clustering was the one, her breast and bright throat bare to the sight, shining like sheen of snow shed on the hills. Try and say that five times fast. The other was swathed with a wimple wound to the throat, and choking her swarthy chin in chalk-white veils. On her forehead were folded em enveloping silks, trestilled about with trefoils and tiny rings. Nothing was bare on that be beldame but the black brows, the two eyes, protruding nose, and stark, stark lips, and those were a sorry sight and exceedingly bleary. A grand lady, God knows, of greatness in the world, well tried. Her body was stumpy and squat, her buttocks bulging and wide. 
Oh no. Oh dear story, why are you saying this? That is that is a way to put it, my dear scholars. I mean no disrespect by any means, but that is an interesting way to write it. More pleasure a man could plot with a sweet one at her side. Again, no offense, it's just that is an interesting description. Celine, I'm sure he also meant no disrespect as he described her rump. Dr. Zadia, medieval thick. <laughs> 40. We'll end at 40, I think. When Gawain had gazed on that gracious looking creature, he gained leave of the Lord to go alone with the lady, along with the ladies. He saluted the senior, sweeping a low brow, but briefly embraced the beautiful one, kissing her in courtly style and complimenting her. My goodness, how do you do that? They craved his acquaintance, and he quickly requested to be their faithful follower if they would so favor him. They took him between the, they took him between them, and talking, they led him to a high room. By the hearth, they asked first for spices, which unsittingly men sped, which unsittingly men sped to bring and always with heartwarming, hard, heady wine. In loving kindness, the Lord leaped up repeatedly, and many times reminded them that, Marth, that mirth should flow, elaborately lifted up his hood, looped it on a spear, and offered it as a mark of honor to whoever should prove able to make the most mirth that merry yuletide. Oh my! And I shall say, I swear to strive with the best, before this garment goes from me, by my good friend's help. So with his mirth, the mighty lord made things merry. To gladden Sir Gawain with... Was that the knight, or was that Gawain? That has to be Gawain. Just making sure my voice is all right. So with his mirth, the mighty lord made things merry. To gladden Sir Gawain with games and hall that night. Until the time being spent... The Lord demanded light. Gawain took his leave and went to rest in rare delights. And we will stop there, my dear wonderful scholars. I think it, 40 is a good even number to stop our story. Oh my goodness. So as you can see, it is interesting language. Even 20, great reading. Oh, thank you, thank you. Here some strolls. Um... It, I, like I said, it's kind of interesting that they skip over all these quests as if the author is like, yes, he went on all these amazing things, but that's not the story we're telling, so we're going to move on. Celine, more's the pity to part, but thanks for the lovely session. Ah, thank you so much, Celine. Thank you for being here. Much appreciated. Um, it is... And it's interesting that Gawain as is mentioned as being one of the he's mentioned as one of the, being the most noble knights and yet he describes himself as one of the weakest knights. That's another interesting thing I'm finding. Um, it's it's going to be interesting where this story is going because it is the time of year he's supposed to get his head chopped off so the question is will he reach there in time? And uh fill his promise. So, let's talk about next week. Next week, we will be playing more of a short hike on... Oh, before I mention, this Sunday, as in last time, 4 o'clock Central, I will be taking part in the Dracula collab read-through. Um, I think we are actually coming to the part where I will actually start some readings. Kind of nervous, kind of excited. Expect some interesting voices. Let's put it that way. So um, it will be at Oseo, Oseo's channel, like last time. Celine Dracula collab. Yes, yes, I am taking part in a collab where I am one of several people who are reading the book Dracula. I am voicing um, Quincy Morris and Von Helsing. So it'll be interesting. Private Mac, for some reason, I feel like counting. No! 
I don't think it's that kind of Dracula, Private Maverick. Um, it's not that kind of vampire. But that's happening on Sunday. Celine, oh, I'd love to. He- I'd love to hear your Van Helsing. It's gonna be interesting. Excuse me. Um, Celine, when and where is the collab? It is this Sunday, 4 p.m. Central. I believe that's 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, it will be in Aseo's voice channel. Aseo's uh, stream. If you have never been to, it's uh, I'm trying to remember the name. I've it's been a long day, my dear scholars. Oh yes, yes, I will shout them out. Just brand get the so you know where we will be. find the name. So it will be at this channel, which I'm about to shout out. You'll be there. Um, again, 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern. Really looking forward to it. I'm excited to start reading my parts in the story. Um, it will be fantastic. Um, so then Tuesday, we will be continuing our gameplay of a short hike, if everything goes according to plan. And if everything goes according to plan on Thursday, we will be reading more of Sir Gawain. And the story itself is not a very long story. I think we're about halfway through the book already. It's a very short story. It's it's not a very long poem. So we might actually uh, finish it next stream. We'll see. So, before we go, let's see if there is someone we can raid tonight. Um, oh! I see uh, Drewy Jelly is celebrating their two-year anniversary affiliate anniversary they are playing dragon quest let's go raid them for this evening so my dear scholars i say unto you good evening good morning good afternoon till we meet each other again at the study take care and i shall see you next time farewell and bye bye